50 years ago. Man is about to launch himself on a trip to the moon. Mankind redefined what is possible. Lift off on Apollo 11. This is the story of a generation's ambition. All I can think of, this is nuts. The risks they took. If I had been older, I might have had a heart attack. And if that failed, you had two dead men on the uh, surface of the moon. The people who blazed the trail. I was the only woman in, in the field. I was a part of it, a very important part of it. It's wonderful. The generations they would inspire. Apollo 11 is a national watershed event. I get emotional when I kind of think about it. The technology that made those dreams come true. You have to be pretty precise. And if you goof, bad things happen. This is the story of American ingenuity. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. One of the greatest human achievements in engineering ever, ever done. And the greatest leap in the history of civilization. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. This is the story of Apollo 11, 50 years later. It was 1961, the heart of the Cold War, and the Soviet Union had reason to celebrate. Cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin had just become the first human to reach space. The United States had been watching with a wary eye ever since the Soviet satellite Sputnik entered Earth's orbit. And with the space race now well underway, many Americans feared the U.S. was falling behind. By that May, President John F. Kennedy was determined to move ahead. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. The United States had a total of 15 minutes of human spaceflight experience. So it was a really short suborbital flight uh, with Alan Shepard at the beginning of the month. And by the 25th of May, President Kennedy was proposing Project Apollo. It was a daring challenge that would ignite American momentum. With new urgency, NASA's fledgling Mercury and Gemini projects scored quick success. Zero G and I feel fine. John Glenn's solo orbit and for the first time, spacewalks. NASA astronauts, engineers, and American industry spent the decade working round the clock. And by 1967, it was time for Apollo's first manned flight. But before it could take off, tragedy struck. Flames trapped the three-man crew inside the cabin during a launch test. There was no escape. But the heartbreaking setback proved temporary. And with a critical redesign, Apollo was back on track. Christmas Eve, 1968, the world watched as Apollo 8 astronauts ventured further than humans had ever traveled. I can see the entire Earth now out of the center window. Bringing us our first full view of home, an image that helped unite Americans at the end of a turbulent year. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good Earth. Seven months later, the moment arrived. NASA was ready. And after years of training, so was the carefully selected team of Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and Michael Collins. I felt very fortunate to, uh, first of all, to be on that crew, and second, to fly with, uh, with Neil and, and Buzz. Neil had been an X-15 pilot. Buzz, on the other hand, was the whiz-bang orbital expert from MIT. So the two of them were extraordinarily uh, well trained and competent, and I was delighted to fly with them. On the morning of July 16, 1969, the trio made their way to the launch pad. When we had been out to uh, pad 39 before, it was a hub of machine activity. Not today. Nobody's around. We're the only ones. The action this day was in mission control and along the beach and highways where a million spectators had gathered. We're on time at the present time for our planned liftoff of 32 minutes past the hour. As the astronauts climbed aboard, the world held its breath. When I was standing up there, here is the most gigantic complex pile of machinery you've ever seen in your life. T-minus one minute, 35 seconds on the Apollo mission, the flight to land, the first men on the moon. The eight-day journey was about to begin. Five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. All six million pounds of the massive Saturn V rocket roared skyward. Each of its three stages firing to power into Earth's orbit in mere minutes. 
Once there, after circling the planet one and a half times, the rocket's third stage fired again, propelling the spacecraft out of orbit and toward its target. Collins, piloting the command module, took the controls. His first order of business, separating Columbia from the spent rocket, turning it around and docking it with Eagle, the lunar landing module, known as the LEM, all while moving at 17,000 miles an hour. I always think of it as a long and very fragile uh, daisy chain of events. If, uh, if you break one little link in the chain, uh, you got deep trouble. For the next three days, they hurtled toward the moon. As the mission goes on, event by event by event, you, you, you never get a chance to relax. You worry about, oh God, what next? Before long, they had entered lunar orbit. There, Collins would stay in the command module while Armstrong and Aldrin moved into the LEM. Okay, all flight controllers going around the horn, going to go for undocking. Okay, retro, go. Fido, go, guide, go. After a series of checks, the two pulled apart. Roger, how does it look? The Eagle has wings. The Eagle was now on its own. Still looking very good. Houston, you're a go for landing, over. Suddenly, alarms sound. A warning the crew didn't recognize threatens to abort the mission. 1201. 1201. Roger, 1201 alarm. NASA engineers immediately identify it as an overloaded computer, and the Apollo guidance system is able to quickly resolve the problem. Okay, we're go. We're go. Same tide. We're go. The landing was still on, but Armstrong realized they had overshot their target by four miles, with a boulder field now below. Taking the controls, he spotted flat terrain further away. Hey, 75 feet. Guys looking good, down a half. And with just 30 seconds of fuel left in the tank. Okay, engine stop. We copy you down, Eagle. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. A smooth landing in the sea of tranquility. Man on the moon. Oh, boy. Thank you. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, we're going to be busy for a minute. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. <laughs> and several hours later, Armstrong was ready to make history. Okay, Neil, we can see you coming down the ladder now. Armstrong is on the moon. Yeah, Neil Armstrong, 38-year-old American, standing on the surface of the moon. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Taking the most famous footsteps in history, he relayed what he saw. Surface is fine and powdery. I can pick it up loosely with my toe. There seems to be no difficulty in moving around. A colorless, rock-filled world. It has a stark beauty all its own. It's uh, like much of the high desert of the uh, United States. It's uh, different, but it's very pretty out here. Soon, it was Aldrin's turn to emerge. Okay, ready for me to come out? All set. Okay, I'm on the top step. Beautiful view. Is that something? Magnificent sight out here. Magnificent desolation. Together, they set up a camera to capture the barren moonscape. Tell me if you got a picture, Houston. Well, we've got a beautiful picture, Neil. Using every moment of their two and a half hour moonwalk, they collected rock samples, conducted experiments, and dedicated a plaque. They came in peace for all mankind. And then spoke by phone to President Richard Nixon. Hello, Neil and Buzz. I just can't tell you how proud we all are. Because of what you have done, the heavens have become a part of man's world. Thank you, Mr. President. It's a great honor and privilege for us to be here. While they explored the surface, Collins was orbiting, alone, overhead, rounding the moon every two hours, and seeing the Earth rise 30 times. Columbia, this is Houston reading you loud and clear over. Uh, I believe they're setting up the flag now. I guess you're about the only person around that doesn't have TV coverage of the scene. That's all right, I don't mind a bit. The question that the press directed to me, almost exclusively, weren't you terribly lonely? And. Uh, all I could think of, this is nuts. Uh, I, it never occurred to me that I was uh, lonely. Through mission control, I, I felt like I was, part of the time I was down there with him, at least I understood what was going on. And he understood that the riskiest part of the mission was just ahead. The one that I worried about the most was Neil and Buzz uh, coming up from the lunar surface and meeting me in my 60 mile orbit above them. When Eagle, the lunar module, lifted off from the moon, there was just one engine. If that failed, 
You had two dead men on the uh, surface of the moon. That whole procedure, that was the part of the mission that I sweated more than any of the other parts. But when it was time to go, the engine fired and the Eagle rose. 1,000 feet high, 80 feet uh, per second vertical rise. Before long, it had redocked with Columbia. Very smooth, very quiet ride. Reunited, they were ready to fire out of lunar orbit and begin the three-day journey home. To fulfill President Kennedy's goal, they had to return safely and to re-enter Earth's atmosphere. They had just a 20-mile wide window. Trying to hit a 20-mile target from 230,000 miles is, you have to be pretty precise. Too shallow an angle and they'd bounce back into space in a never-ending orbit. Too steep and they'd burn up plunging back to Earth at nearly 25,000 miles an hour. 36,000 feet per second. The team in mission control kept them on course. Apollo 11, Apollo 11, this is Hornet, Hornet, over. Splashing down in the Pacific where the USS Hornet was waiting. Not knowing what they might have brought back with them, they'd spend the next three weeks in quarantine. Finally, it was time to celebrate. America had won the space race, but while seen as a victory here at home, around the world, Paula was embraced as a triumph of humanity. Neil, Buzz, and I were privileged to have an around-the-world trip, I, and I was just amazed by the response that we received. Everywhere we went, people said, we did it. We, humankind, we left this planet. People around the world were naming their kids after the astronauts. They became sort of global heroes, world heroes. It was a feat few thought even possible at the dawn of the decade. And now, with just months to spare, President Kennedy's dream had been realized. A tribute to American ingenuity and lifting America's spirits amid the horrors of Vietnam as the Cold War carried on. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard.